What is going on, everybody? Welcome to a fantastic Monday here on the Damage Report. I am Francesca Fiorentini in for John Idarola, who is still on vacation. How dare he? Um, but luckily, joining me for this fantastic Monday is Dan Evans, Dan of the internet. Dan, how are you? Doing well on a Fran and Dan Monday. You like how your name is first yes. this time? Dantastic. <laughs> Love that. Doesn't work. I mean, it could work. It's fine. I'm good. I'm good. We there. There's a lot to get to. Some fun stuff. Some old stuff. New stuff. Something borrowed. Something blue stuff. It's a wedding, effectively. We're we're, we're gonna love it. I I love red weddings. Apparently, the new <laughs> Game of Thrones prequels. All right, so we'll live with that. <laughs> okay, I haven't watched it, but. I will at some point, but just saying red wedding makes me like, oh hell yeah, it's good, it's good. It's gonna end bad, but it might be good along the way. Um, that is something that John Iderola is wrong about. His take on Game of Thrones is incorrect. Anyway, um, with that, if you are here, make sure you are liking and uh, sharing the stream right now. Of course, subscribing, what do you do? And if you're not subscribed, um, also we're gonna be reading your chat. So send in all the love, You know, summon back Iderola. With those super chats, with those comments, Dan and I will be um, reading them. Uh, we got some polling data. We've got some new excuses on why Trump kept those classified documents. Elon Musk, again, a, just a mm, environmental champion. We're going to look at that. Um, and then a little rundown of meanwhile in, of course, not forgetting that the United States is part of the world. So with all that, Dan, are you ready to do this? Born ready. <laughs> I believe that. Um, as we all know, uh, let's jump into um, this because honestly, the ghouls don't stop on the weekend. Here we go. <laughs> That is right, it is time for the Monday Menace. And this Monday, our menacing creature is none other than Wisconsin Senator Ron Johnson, who is currently in a pretty tight race for his seat. This is again, one of the seats the Democrats are hoping to flip with Democrat Mandela Barnes. We'll get into some of that very interesting polling a little bit later. But why is he the Monday Menace? Well, because he was speaking to local Wisconsin news and effectively admitted the yeah, he had something to do with the January 6th alternate slate of electors, but like not that much, like a little bit, like whatever, like it's not even relevant. So he was asked whether or not he would testify to the January 6th committee, and he said this quote, What would they ask me to testify about? Johnson said when asked if he would testify before the committee, I had nothing to do with the alternate slate. I had no idea anybody was going to ask me to deliver those. My involvement in that attempt to deliver. Span the course of a couple seconds. You know, when a crime is done like quickly, they call it a quick crime. And therefore, it's like not a crime. Do you, know, do you ever hear that defense? It's gotten many, many people off. I'm surprised you are not versed in that. So he said it was just a, just a little bit, just a few, a few seconds. Um, he did have, and we can go to these shots uh, now, he did have, remember, when he's been asked about his role. Uh, in the alternate slate of electors, what he was doing. This is how he usually responds. Here he is pretending to be on the phone. How much did you know about what your chief of staff was doing with the alternate slates of electors? No, you're not. I can see your phone. I can see your screen. I see the screensaver. Your 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 kids are there. I don't know where you guys are. You're in Machu Picchu. It looks like a Tinder profile. Uh, so that was him. Uh, this was in June, pretending not to hear the reporters, pretending to be on the phone. Then later, he's like, "All right, the jig is up. I'm gonna respond." And here's what he ultimately said: "This was a staff to staff exchange, and I was, you know, basically unaware of it, and." The chief staff contacted the vice president staff, said, do you want this? They said no, and, and we didn't deliver it, and that's the end of the story. But why was he even asking for that? 
because somebody delivered this to our office and asked to deliver that to the vice president. Did you support the, his efforts to try to get those slates to the vice president? No, I, I had no knowledge of this. Who Somebody just delivered something to my office and so I just passed the message. I am merely the messenger. Again, let's revisit what that message was supposed to be. And remember that according to the Times, the Trump plan began with that effort to persuade Republican officials in targeted states, Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, Nevada, New Mexico, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin to help draft or at least put their names on documents that declared Mr. Trump to be the victor. Once the false pro Trump slate of electors had been created, Mr. Trump and his allies turned to the second part of the plan, strong arming Vice President Mike Pence into considering them during the joint session of Congress on January 6. The point was to persuade Mr. Pence to say that the election was somehow flawed or in doubt or to delay to the certification of the electors count. And again, the third part of the plan was just storming the Capitol. We saw how that went down. Dan, before I could get to you, let's remember what the January 6th committee um, revealed, which was text messages from the chief of staff and Ron Johnson's office and someone working for uh, Mike Pence. <laughs> so this is between Sean Riley and Chris Hodgson. We don't have it here, but this begins with SUP from Chris Hodgson, which is my favorite ever. Sean says, Johnson needs to hand something to V POTUS, please advise. Chris Hodgson, what is it? This is by the way, noon, January 6th. Sean Riley, alternate slate of electors for Michigan and Wisconsin because archivist didn't receive them. Oh, That's funny. Chris Hodgson, do not give that to him. No, mm, yeah, no, nah. bye block. Like, And that was it, and so here you have, direct staff member with Ron Johnson, someone working with Mike Pence. These are in the waning hour mob, literally amassing at the door. Um, here was the last alternative, I guess, and it didn't work, so you sick the mob. Dan, Ron Johnson, we're gonna get into the polls, but does what do you think about this? You think he's gonna be asked to testify? I mean, he should be compelled to testify. Those text messages are pretty damning. Um, he said his part in January 6th only took a few seconds or lasted a few seconds. He was originally saying that he had nothing to do with January 6th. So apparently his uh, statement that he had nothing to do with January 6th last even less than his supposed influence or part in that uh, event. But uh, the, the back and forth he's constantly trying to make, it's very clear that he's trying to hide the possible accountability from here. The Republicans are keep playing this game where January 6th is at the same time, not a big deal, but also something they don't wanna touch and be related towards because they fear, fear it might be toxic for them. Uh, will it be ultimately toxic for them? I don't know, because I think there's a large part of their base that does believe that, that Trump, even if he didn't win, should have been declared the victor at all costs. I still think that Ron Johnson should be compelled to testify because there's clearly something he's hiding and he needs to be on the record. Absolutely. And like, you know, as, as good as reporters, I think, are doing, hounding him, trying to make sure that he they know he knows that they know he's on a fake phone call and such, or you know, a local news outlet obviously covering his race and just asking him, hey, this is kind of the biggest thing in national news right now. What was your involvement with that? And he's like, ah, it's a nothing burger. Um, at some point he's gonna have to answer for this. And at some point you gotta be honest, like, so what is it? Either you did know about it and you did help and there was a plan or you're an idiot. And these folks are doing this under your nose using your office to do it to send these alternate slate of electors. Folks who've been investigated now by the January 6th committee and even some by the FBI. Like we're, we're talking serious crimes here um, and he's like, well, either like I, I, I'm like, what? No, okay, but a little bit I did, but not really, but kind of. And like that answer doesn't fly when you're sitting in front of Congress. Um, by the way, he is part of Congress. He is a senator, but maybe not for long. So according to a Fox News, yes, right, a Fox News poll published recently, Mandela Barnes is edging Johnson in the Wisconsin Senate race uh, with 50%. If the election were today, choosing Mandela Barnes over Ron Johnson, huge, 40 to 4, Johnson's 46%. Seems like Barnes has obviously less name recognition. There's less um, overall excitement, but of course we know 
knowing that your current senator is a lying idiot effectively will move you to vote for the other person. Whether or not you know Mandela Barnes is like a household name or not. But the other part of this obviously is Roe versus Wade and protecting abortion rights in Wisconsin. Majority of Wisconsinites, 55%. Disapprove of the US Supreme Court's overturning of Roe v. Wade, and those voters largely back Barnes by 67 points. Those approving of the Dobbs decision, 37%, widely favor Johnson by 83 points. So there you have it. One of those issues, in addition to we're going to get into some polling later on, what else is driving people to the polls? I am, I don't love to get too excited about polls because after 2016, I literally believe no one and I've said this before, Dan. But like, it says a lot that, you know, Mandela Barnes is effectively now in, a, in multiple polls and this a Fox News poll is beating Ron Johnson. Yeah, I'll also uh, sprinkle a little bit of cynicism in there with you, Francesca. And note <laughs> that that poll has a 3% margin of error and he's leading by four points. That's a tie and it's August, so don't look a lot too can closely, change. Dan. But <laughs> the, I mean, if, if a lot changes, I mean, what if he comes, is if he's called to testify, that only helps Barnes. I think so too, but I also like I reminisce to a lot of these cases where you have high profile Republicans that Democrats really want to unseat. And so there's a lot of money that gets poured into those races, even though those candidates may or may not be the strongest ones. I think at the end of the day, look, Ron Johnson said, hey, listen, I received something. So therefore, I was just gonna be the messenger and pass it along to the vice president. Mm -hmm. If his constituents don't actually believe that that's how Ron Johnson works, not just in a, oh, I got something from, I was just handed something, I'm not gonna vet it at all. Is Ron Johnson doing that with his constituents? Is he doing that with the people who vote him in the office? Is he just taking the things that they're saying and, oh, I don't know, I just saw this. I'm gonna pass it along to the people I'm like running with or in power with. Right. I don't know if that's the case here. And so that's ultimately what it's gonna come down to. Do the people of Wisconsin feel that Ron Johnson is best representing their interests? And I, I would be happy with <laughs> any Senate Demo uh, flip, honestly, given this year and how it's supposed to go. So. My fingers are crossed, but I'm not gonna hold my breath for this. Absolutely, and and I mean, it just shows how far we've slid to the right in this country when basic bodily autonomy rights and democracy are the two biggest things driving people to the polls. We didn't think it would get this dark. I mean, maybe we did, but here we are, and suddenly it's like, well, do you or don't you believe in you know the election process, and do you or don't you believe that you know people shouldn't bleed out? from miscarriages and not be able to say when they want to be parents. I mean, it's basic stuff. It's just it's basic, do we like fascism or not? Anyway, yeah. let's, yeah. I was gonna say one more thing, maybe or maybe not their Senator Ron Johnson may or may not have done as what George Bluth called light treason <laughs> in arrested development. You know, that might be something they want their Senator to be a part of or not a part of. I don't know, we'll let the people in Wisconsin decide. I hope they decide right. Amen. Investigating Trump and democracy being on the line. Apparently, those are two issues that are at the forefront of voters' minds coming into the midterm elections in November. That is according to a recent NBC News poll, which is pretty interesting. And again, we're in the middle of the January 6th committee hearings. We're learning more and more about all different kinds of senators and Congress people's involvement. Um, and all the funny text messages that Fox News hosts have sent uh, the chief of staff during that day. But let's look at some, uh, let's, let's talk about investigating Trump, right? So here was the idea. Okay, if the raid happens on Mar-a-Lago, it's gonna look I think some were arguing really, really bad for Democrats. What? Bad for Democrats? So this is the fear, right? This is the sort of centrist fear that often happens, which is like, if we do anything bold, maybe we will face backlash even though there was a literal crime committed. It turns out those centrist pollsters and pundits were wrong because actually a majority of voters, a majority of all voters, approve of Trump investigations. Um, this was the question, do you think investigations into alleged wrongdoing by the former president should continue because he needs to be held accountable, not continue because they're politically motivated and divide the nation? 57% said, yeah, they should continue. 
And that could be all the things, right? We're talking financial crimes. We're talking stolen documents crimes. We're talking overturning a democratic election crime, right? Like there's many different buckets of crimes. It's a little bit of like one of those carnival games with the horses and which one's gonna get there first type thing. Um, so that was pretty interesting. There's more. Um, uh, more on the January 6 events, a combined 50% of voters uh, say Trump is solely or mainly responsible for January 6, up five points since May. Before the House committee investigating the attack began holding multiple televised hearings, that's compared with 49% saying Trump is only somewhat responsible or not responsible at all, which is down from six points in May. So those points correspond to my faith in the American people just like, all right, like this is doing something. That being said, and I don't know if this solidifies or dings my faith in the American people. Um, what about Biden's job approval rating? Yeah, it's not really going nowhere. So uh, back in April last year, it was a 51%. May of this year was 42%. August? 40, still 42%. And again, this was August 12th through 16th. So the sign, the signature of the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, the climate bill, not been factored into this, it seems. Um, so who knows? Maybe that approval rating will be bumped up a little bit, but it's very flatlined, it seems. Um, in terms of who people want in charge, November's mid in November, 47% of registered voters prefer Republicans winning control of Congress, while 45% want Democrats in charge. Okay. In May's poll, the parties were tied 46-46. So again, yes, Trump did the wrong stuff, but I still want Republicans in power. This is why I hate polls. Um, and then finally, uh, Democratic enthusiasm does seem to be up, obviously. Given the decision around Dobbs and the overturning of Roe v. Wade, according to the survey, the NBC News survey, 68% of Republicans express a high level of interest. Um, oh, sorry, this is just general excitement. General excitement might be um, high level of interest in the coming, upcoming election, registering either a nine or 10 on a 10 point scale versus 66% for Democrats. Two point advantage, that two point GOP advantage is down from 17 points in March and eight points in May. So it seems close now, but it, there was much more enthusiasm from Republicans before um, versus now. And Democrats, are we ever excited about anyone? No. The real thing, the real, real issue, the real graph, here we go. Here's an Ida Roller graph for you. Um, what issues matter most to voters? It seems like threats to democracy, number one, kind of far outstanding, almost to over 20%. Um, threats to democracy is the number one issue, followed by cost of living, jobs in the economy, um, immigration, climate change, guns, abortion all the way down, which is surprising. So again, this doesn't feel like the most conservative poll, um, but threats to democracy feels like Despite Liz Cheney not winning her reelection campaign, um, feels like something that people are of all, all stripes, all political parties are coalescing around. Um, the poll also back to abortion rights, it did find that 58% of voters disapprove of Roe being overturned and 38% approve. So um, yes, everyone thinks the country's heading in the wrong direction. They've always thought that till from the end of the beginning of time and the beginning of polls. We don't need to go into that. Dan, 57%, yes, we should investigate Trump. 58% overturning of Roe v. Wade, not a good idea. What do you make of this and how it puts us going into these elections? Yeah, it's, to me what it makes of it is that Big picture over the past two years, like we've been in the minutia of all of the news and whatnot. But big picture over the past two years is that Joe Biden's administration tried to go in saying they would play ball and actually um, fight against obstructionist Republicans. They didn't really end up doing that that much. And that's why you see the hit in Joe Biden's poll numbers, at least why I speculate. Republicans went in on culture issues. It started with Dr. Seuss books just to feel the waters out. Then they went towards um, cancel culture and wokeism in Florida and creating all these other permutations of the word woke that clearly makes you know that they never talked to any black people about it. And 
continuing to kind of go all in on, I think going too far in overturning Roe v. Wade and going buck wild with uh, threats to democracy. So I think those things are top of mind and I'm happy to see you know, all these polls are little bits of data literally and they're moments in history of snapshots because I remember a CNN poll that was from late July that was basically saying that people's opinions of Trump in January 6th, well, the majority of them said that, okay, he seems to have done something wrong. Even a lot of people said that it was outright illegal what he did. Mm. It seemed that from that poll that people's opinions hadn't really changed as a result of the hearings. So I don't know, maybe that was, poll was new, maybe the information's marinating a little bit more. But to yeah. me, the top line thing there is, I'm happy that at least a poll seems to suggest that threats to democracy are a top line issue. It's been a top line issue I know in our heads for at least since before 2016. 16, if not before that, but all the other things there, I was, yeah, abortion is a little bit lower than I'd like to see on the list. Climate change, <laughs> for how long you and I and all the folks on Damage Report have been doing the show, to see it that high in a poll of right. issues Americans care about, that's great. And so hopefully the um, Inflation Reduction Act, which I hope if Democrats are able to message the name of that act and point to things that are actually going well, while inflation seems to be heading down or like being flatlining right now, mm -hmm. then maybe that will be the smartest thing Joe Manchin's done for the party so far. Because naming that and marketing off of that, Democrats aren't great at marketing or messaging. But if they can turn that and say, look, we did a thing for you that addresses climate change and the economy and jobs and the stuff that apparently polls say y'all are interested in, that should ideally translate to what leftists have been screaming about this entire two years, which are bring material issues to voters and they will reward you for that. Yeah, absolutely. And oh man, giving Manchin credit, woo, yee, but yeah, I mean, I do think that yes, addressing real world issues is interesting. I mean, is very, very important. But this also shows you that politically they're they're like, but we also need to make sure crooks aren't necessarily running the country. And like between again, the documents being taken, this is a poll that was conducted after the raid. Um, between the financial crimes that we know are unfolding in New York courts, uh, and obviously the January 6 hearings, like some of that is starting to percolate. So I do feel like you know, oftentimes I'm like, we're so Trump obsessed, Trump, 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 blah, blah, blah. And yet, to have any kind of accountability, to move on in any kind of way, yeah, we got to slay this dragon dead, all right? This is not a good dragon, all right? I'm sorry, Dragon Squad. But like, this is insanely critical, and it seems like it's not falling on deaf ears. It seems like there is strategy for once, it might be paying off for Democrats. That being said, you gonna pass any kind of voting rights legislation? Oh, okay, no, never mind. All right, no, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. We can just let that languish. <laughs> uh, but we will see as we head into the election. Um, let's take our first break, though. We have so much more on the other side of this, so don't go nowhere. Damn it! I have to. We have to do good news now. I don't have that much good news. I think the poll was pretty good news. I thought we had a pretty positive okay. spin on that relatively. Okay, okay, let me see if there's any, there's some funny news. Then there's some, oh, uh, oh. it's nothing's amazing, but I will try to give everything a sunny spin. <laughs> but let's, uh, let us jump in to this little piece here. I'm curious, since you're a member of the intelligence committee, what use could a former president have for classified or top secret information once he's left office. Why, why bring it home with him to Florida? Well, it's, I don't know. I mean, you have to ask him, but certainly we all know that every former president has access to uh, their documents. It's how they write their memoirs. They don't have acts, you know, great recall of everything that's occurred in their administration. They can't remember everything that happened. So sometimes you take some documents home, you do a little bit of selly welly on the, you know, dark eBay just between like world leaders. <laughs> selly welly, that's my word. Um, that is Ohio Representative Mike Turner um, claiming that now Trump probably took the documents because he's trying to write his memoir. Right, guys? You know how Trump is such a prolific writer? Is this going to be in all caps? I am very excited. How many, like the word cloud will just be like five words, sad, great, um, what else? 
very tremendous, tremendous, lots of tremendous, just all caps. It'll be the hardest thing to read ever. And obviously mostly pictures. In fact, um, let's just look into whether there's any validity to this. Just is he is he working on a memoir? Uh, so far, no, no plans to write a memoir. The former president released a photo book though of his time in the White House for which he contributed the captions. Oh, that's like writing. Here I am yelling at a kid mowing the lawn. Uh, he said last year that he was writing the book of all books about his term as president, but is yet to sign a publishing deal. The book of all books. The best part about it is you don't have to read it. Just <laughs> pictures, scratch and sniff, little fuzzy wuzzies, you know, like that's it is Pat the Bunny, but like Pat the President, um, which I feel like he would be into. No, he's not writing a memoir, Dan, and here's why he's not, is because it would mean that his terms were over. If he's writing a reflection of what had happened, that means what had happened is done. And my man wants to run for president again in 2024. So I don't think, sorry, Mike Turner, that he's writing a memoir. Yeah, this GOP lawmaker all like, oh, this is Donald Trump, you know, just like Maggie Haberman or just like, you know, Michael Wolf writing Fire and Fury. He's just saving all the juicy stuff so he can release it in his book a couple years from now for the book <laughs> tour. That's how he's gonna get attention for it. Obviously, you're gonna take the classified documents because that's going to go in his next, the book of all books, Art of the Steel, how I actually won the election. And the steel has actually nothing to do with the documents that I stole. Those I just kept in very safe manila envelopes as Rudy Giuliani told you. Now, yes. I, I, I can't possibly imagine this, but I don't know. We're connoisseurs of right wing excuses and lies. And mm -hmm. January 6th has just caught everyone in 4K. Like they just have nothing to say about it. <laughs> writing, like writing in a memoir, that is one of the worst excuses I've heard. And I've heard some really bad excuses over the past couple of weeks. Yeah, and, and this dude, I'm trying to remember what he's, he's, this guy is on like the intelligence committee. Cool. Like, this man, this is this is how far we've fallen with these Republican lawmakers. Is that even someone who is tasked with regularly deciding how to protect our nation, what kinds of intelligence, you know, operations need funding, right? Like what what is actually going on? What are the threats on all kinds of levels? That person is defending potential nuclear codes, potential nuclear secrets being taken by a former president to his golf resort. Again, let's remember, documents recovered from Mar-a-Lago reportedly included information related to nuclear weapons and highly classified programs, with some legal experts saying that Trump is suspected of being in violation of the Espionage Act for keeping those documents. And Espionage Act violators could face up to 10 years in jail, a fine or both. Um, and of course, it's only been used against whistleblowers. Dan, I swear, I bet he's gonna just release some like drone footage, you know, of innocent civilians being killed, and he's going to stand for like their their rights, human rights, and against the war machine. Don't you feel like that's just like coming? Oh no, Trump's got the UFO documents. That's what this is all about. If we elect him <laughs> in 2024, he's gonna give us the documents. This is this is what it's all leading up to. Joe Rogan's been talking about this. Alex Jones been talking about this. And you yep. know what? I'm gonna take a stand on TYT right now and say no. <laughs> None of that's gonna happen. This is I, I again. I love the game that they are trying to play. That their king did not steal classified documents from the White House. Every excuse they make just digs a deeper hole. And I I, I love watching it's. It is art to me. Please, yes. more. yeah, no, no, no. I, and, and right now, you know, it seems like a federal federal judge is saying that the affidavit should be released um, more than just the warrant, so we can actually see not just like which box was stolen and what, but like what it possibly contained. I honestly think that is a good idea. I think it is a good idea yes. because, it, yeah, because the more mystery the right has around this, the more. Or they can claim that, yeah, it's it was for a memoir. They were totally safe down there. Like that they can make up any kind of excuse they want. And don't 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 get it twisted. They're still gonna make up excuses. But if they have some hard cold, more hard cold evidence, which is like, no, 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 this is what it was related to, which by the way, they'll be like, well, what is the code? 
the nuclear code. You don't even know it. Why don't you give it to me? We should all be able to have the nuclear. Like, come on, man. There's only so much you're gonna know. But I do think that somehow it's still not real in their minds and they can still spin it to not be real. So it needs to get even realer for them. Um, but the book of all books, I'm waiting. I'm so excited for the book of all books. The art of the steel, I love it. It's gonna be ghost written too, right? And then he's gonna be like, that was my ghost writer. Yeah, uh, Eric, Trump, Eric Trump is gonna claim credit for it and then get immediately shot down in public. <laughs> <Exactly>. Verbally, verbally. <laughs> yes, verbally dressed down by his dad. Like, I thought you wanted the color by numbers. Let us, uh, this, is, this is just a fun one. So maybe it's not good news, but it's fun. Please take a look. We are direct response. So we don't have that now, Brandon. We don't have that. So we got to. Hope that they pick it up. Love you, man. Up you were two patriots. Right no, oh, I'm sorry about that. that keep fighting, man. Okay, keep fighting. Thank don't you. don't let the libtards call you names. Okay. Don't let them call you an okay. ethnically dubious pillow pusher. Don't let them call you a a marginally uh, brain addled uh, corrupt goofball. <laughs> well, you're doing great. Brain addled corrupt goofball. Mediocre pillow pusher. <laughs> this happened at the end of July. A lot of, and um, we would be remiss were we not to cover this. Um, I apologize if I'm freezing. I feel like I maybe. Uh, uh, that is Mike Lindell being trolled live in a San Diego hotel um, without his pants. Yeah. So if you guys want to just look a little closer, um, if I mean, you do. some of, if. You want to look a little closer, you can also shield your eyes. Mike Lindell is clearly in his boxer briefs. Now I get it might be hot, but he's, <laughs> can we just throw that up again? Can we just watch that one more time? You know, there's a certain part here, again, I only looked for journalistic purposes, but I think he has the common decency <laughs> to have a little napkin in his lap to make sure no food gets on his uh, boxer briefs. He's got his legs out. He's look at him. He's look. Those are shorts. Those are those are shorts. Those aren't even. You can't you can't say those are trunks. From the people who bought you my pillow, it's now my undies. Yes, <laughs> right wing underwear. <laughs> Get yours today. In fact, I, I have mine right now. I'm live on television right now. That was from, uh, by the way, a video from user uh, Samit Smotter. Um, it's happened at the end of July. Um, Trolling Mike Lindell as he's like in a courtyard in San Diego doing an interview. It seems like it might have been on Steve Bannon's podcast, which is like, is he the first on Steve Bannon podcast to not wear pants? Definitely not. Um, of course, Twitter users took just like, you know, had a fun little time with this. Um, e Van B saying he needed the extra pants fabric to make more pillows. Yeah, for sure. What if all of the pillows are like, every single pillow I have worn personally, everyone comes with a Mike Lindell skid mark and uh, that is extra. Actually, he heard, no. <laughs> he heard it was popular on OnlyFans to do a similar thing and eventually found out that like, oh no, this isn't gonna work for me. God. Ugh. Stop paying for underwear, people. I'm sorry. That's all I have to do. I just want to stop paying for Mike Lindell pillows and stop paying for underwear. Um, EK uh, Summerton M on Twitter says, I keep expecting to see Rudy Giuliani sitting at the next table shaving. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. Like the, they're neat. You know, during the Bush administration, um, W, obviously, there's a, there's a compilation. You guys can look it up. Compilation of dumbest George W. Bush moments. Every month, every week, we have a compilation length video, five, 10 minutes of footage of either Trump or one of his dumb lackeys doing something insanely like either brutish or stupid. You know, yes, of course, Giuliani is like, he's taking swigs, he's shaving, he's farting in front of Jenna Ellis during like one of their, what was it, their sort of grand revelations. To say nothing of the Four Seasons debacle, it's just Mike Lindell, man. And by the way, guys, 
this week, this happened in the end of July. Now, Lindell's out there. He's holding a an entire week long like summit on elections to uh, in in Missouri. Jenna Ellis again is going to be there um, because she I think she had like took some grand stand on I forgot what exactly. But like she's back in the orbit. She's not the, the, these people. If they say anything against Trump, they don't leave for long because they realize this is their grift. Here's what I will say, Dan, about Mike Lindell. He's such a true believer. Like, like of all the grifters, you know, of all the people that just do this for money, for clicks, for fame, for whatever. They see a lane, the JD Vance's, right? These like, you know, the people who've turned on a dime. Mike Lindell's always been there, man. He's always loved Trump. He will. He he is ride or die day one. Uh, uh, yeah, you have to reach. It's almost like Scientology. There's a certain level of Trump love that you get to once you start uh, taking legal L's in the, in the <laughs> for, for the love of Donald Trump. Like Alex Jones is now in this echelon uh, in some extent, even though it's not necessarily directly related to Donald Trump because it's the Sandy Hook stuff. Um, he's just in that realm of like Trump loving people who are just facing legal trouble. But then you have Mike Lindell more directly for lying about the Dominion voting machines and being sued by a bunch of companies like that. I, at first, I thought it was a soulless grift. I'm now starting to believe that he just does it for the love of the game. Like he's out there, just like I, I, I love showing up to the idea of more people on Steve Bannon's war room and underwear is just a, a lot of images from this clip. I'm going to want to wipe out of my memory, but yeah, the idea of him <laughs> going, yeah, love of the game. I'm out here 8 a.m. on my vacation, a Florida resort, resort in my underwear, talking to you on a my iPhone on a tripod, telling yep. you about what's going, telling you yep. the latest in Republican ideology. I mean, yes, it's a grift, but at a certain point, it's the love of the game. You're in public in your undies. You love Trump so hard. You love him the hardest. Good. The skateboards are extra fresh just for Trump. True. All right, let's. Uh, that was that was our comic relief of the day of the hour. We have to jump into this incredibly serious and very much a trigger warning video. Um, hey, just some police brutality once again. Repeatedly hitting him in the head. So uh, that was in Crawford County, Arkansas. Um, the three, those three officers have been placed on leave, but we all know what that means in the world of policing. Um, they're shown they're restraining a man in a parking lot who um, supposedly did horrible things. Let's look into what that was. Um, his the, the man's name is uh, Worcester or Worcester. I don't know how to pronounce this word. Sir, I'm sorry. Let's we'll say Worcester. Uh, he's accused of threatening an employee at the convenience store and pushing and punching a deputy in the back of the head after being confronted, according to the Associated Press. Okay, so he apparently did assault an officer. Does it warrant the amount of assault he then received? I would argue no. Um, Worcester was sent to the hospital, was later released and sent to a county jail. He's being charged with second degree battery, resisting arrest, refusal to submit. Possessing an instrument of crime, criminal trespass, oh God, criminal mischief, terroristic threatening, all right, and second degree assault, state police said. State police said they've opened a use of force investigation and will submit their findings to the Crawford County prosecutor who will determine whether the use of force by law enforcement officers was consistent with Arkansas laws. The sheriff, James DeMonte, in a statement hours prior, said that the two deputies involved had been suspended pending the outcome of the investigation. Now, I think we all know how this ends. That is going to be a very quick investigation. The amount of charges that this guy is facing, the fact that he threw a punch, they're alleging first, but we don't know. But again, take a look at some of that video. Like they are pounding his head into the concrete. He he's already resisting at a certain point, Dan, I'm like, you what is the level of resistance? Is it trying to block your head from being 
punched and pushed into the concrete. Like is that, does that qualify as resistance? Cuz that's just like basic human protection. That's just your reaction. Yeah, to me it seems like they did not like this guy. It seems like they're probably giving him an attitude to begin with, but they just let out their rage for the day or their pent up rage for the month and decide to throw the book at him. Like it, right. it's supposed to be in police protocols that yeah, even if you have a violent person, you subdue them in whatever way you can and like Oftentimes, the way they subdue them is immediately, immediately aiming for their guns or tasing them or using some other force like that. Um, and oftentimes, it ends up being lethal. In this case, I'm happy it wasn't lethal, but you do not need to knee him constantly in different parts of his body, like head and shoulders, very vital areas. You mm -hmm. don't need to constantly punch him and get his head into the ground to subdue him. If he was like throwing punches and making threats or whatever, I honestly want to see if there's audio to that video footage right there. What kind of terroristic threats were being made to that guy? What type of battery was happening to that guy? Because we got a lot of the video to work with there. I mean, I think half of these things could be made point for point officers to uh, this guy who they're saying allegedly was being violent with this uh, clerk store owner beforehand. But at the end of the day, if you have handcuffs and the guns and the weapons and you're outnumbering them, it shouldn't take like a brutal schoolyard beatdown to get yep. this guy subdued. And just some more context, that video was taken from a car, uh, from an onlooker, right? So this is a bystander. These are videos that we don't often see. Um, these are videos we may never see. And we don't know if these officers are wearing body cams, if we'll ever get that body cam footage. And again, I agree with Dan, we need to see what happened inside the store. Convenience stores often do have security cams, what was going on? Did he in fact throw the first punch? Um, but we know how this ends in terms of their accountability. There will be none and they're doing this out of spite because they got mad that someone potentially attempted to hit them. And so they're going to beat him within inches of his life. With that, we have to take our second break, but we'll be right back, BRB. All right, are we digging into our final uh, our final little All right, let's do it. Let's do this. Okay, so the man who is going to save the planet one Tesla sale at a time, one overpriced luxury zero emissions vehicle at a time that doesn't actually stop for um children and is kind of a menace on the road. Elon Musk <laughs> uh turns out we found out about a new of a, pri a private flight that he took. Probably, and I've been reporting on private flights for a little bit for TYT. One of the shortest flights I have seen. Let's go to this graphic from Hayden Clarkin. Elon Musk took a nine minute flight to San Francisco from San Jose, y'all, which is five stops on the Caltrain. I literally have no words. There's a map of it. You guys, if you've been to this area, I am from this area. I know exactly what that is. Like I've gone to see like San Jose Sharks hockey games from San Francisco. This is like, it's like a beer and a half of a trip. <laughs> it is super short. It takes you 40 minutes, if that. My man had to take a private nine minute flight. That is that is what, what he did. This is the same guy who, by the way, um, in 2018, said Tesla exists to help reduce the risk of catastrophic climate change, which affects all species on earth. Even if your faith in humanity is faltering, this is worth caring about. Support makes a difference. Thank you. He was so different back then. And a mashup was put together by, of course, Ken Klippenstein of those two screenshots. Um, in case we needed a reminder about how terrible private jets are for the environment, a report from the United Nations warns that we're absolutely, of course, hurtling towards climate disaster if global greenhouse emissions like carbon dioxide don't start dropping by 2025. Researchers pinpoint a potential guideline to keep things sustainable. Everyone on Earth should limit their carbon footprint to a grand total of 2.3 metric tons per year, which Still feels like a lot of tons, but let's look at a private jet. It emits two metric tons of carbon dioxide per hour, per hour. Now, of course, if it's a nine minute flight, I mean, maybe if you're only taking, you know, uh, I mean, you could actually get within under that if you're not taking that many short flights, but like, is Elon in fact doing that? No, and we talked about how 
you know, Kylie Jenner has been doing these, you know, uh, uh, all kinds of folks, whether it's um, Steve Jobs or or um, Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift, Steven Spielberg has also been taking these. So let's just put up this graph. You can see private jet um, versus this is CO2 emissions by vehicle type, emissions by vehicle type, private jet, super yacht, that's fun, a car, and US domestic commercial flight. Interestingly, US domestic commercial flight, not all that bad. Again, these are people who would not be caught dead doing what someone like Bernie Sanders does, which is like do the middle seat and coach, bro, if you need to go around you know, and get to your campaign stops. If you need to go support striking workers in different warehouses. Um, you think Kylie Jenner, even or, or, or Elon Musk, you think these folks are flying commercial? Hell no. Hell no. Um, I don't know. I, I'm like very floored by this. Uh, I think, uh, anyway, let's, let's keep going. Um, the social cost of carbon is a mechanism that allows us to grasp what each ton of carbon costs us as a people and society, explains Maya K. Van Rossum, founder of the organization Green Amendments for Generations. These costs can result from emissions fueled public health problems, agricultural decline, extreme weather damage. According to scientists and experts under the Biden administration, every one ton of carbon literally costs $51. She explains that means we're all on the hook for more than $422,000. Thanks to Taylor Swift's 2022 jet setting alone. Yeah, so look, Tay Swift, T Swift, whatever we call her. I liked your last two albums. They really did help me get through the pandemic, I'm not gonna lie. But wouldn't it be dope if you flew commercial? Dan? Yeah, I have a lot of thoughts about this whole like flight gate sort of things that's happening because I have a lot of pilot friends and all the logistics of this get even worse the more you dig down into them. Um, I'm also not necessarily a Bay Area native, but spent a lot of time up there. That's a 45 minute trip, brother, like at any time all. Also, you're Elon Musk, dude. The meetings work around you. If you're gonna be <laughs> 30 minutes late because you're in traffic, damn, it just be like that for whoever's on the other side. Like for someone who claims to be someone who defends the climate and wants to look at, okay, how do we think about life on Earth? How do we think about life beyond Earth? Because it's so unsustainable here. When you actually look closely, and there's been a lot more attention brought to this, that mm -hmm. California was going to have a high speed rail project that probably would have made it very easy to get from San Francisco to San Jose very quickly and um, sustainably, given that it would use electricity and hopefully be backed by a lot of um, environmental ways to generate that electricity. Right. But Elon Musk specifically fought to stop that plan with his Hyperloop idea by basically creating traffic in tubes by sending Teslas uh, in tubes at fast speeds across the state. He had a bunch of different companies try to develop Hyperloop ideas. They got convinced them to build a tunnel underneath Los Angeles as a test that ultimately just created traffic underneath Los Angeles and Las Vegas and things like that. So he was pushing for that instead of California's high speed rail project, yeah. specifically to derail it. So let's dispel with the idea that Elon Musk is someone who cares about the climate. He cares about his ego. And if he's able to use climate change to uh, say that he has this strong persona that he's doing things for the environment, at the end of the day, it feeds his ego, it feeds his sort of cult of personality he's developed. So he's gonna care about that much more than he cares about the environment, much more than he cares about people who are living here. And the proof is in the history. Yes, absolutely. If it's not a vanity project, he doesn't want any part of it. And also it just shows you, I mean, the carbon budget, it's like anything. It's like all of income inequality in this country generally that billionaires absolutely emit more CO2. And if we didn't have billionaires and if private jets, let's say were not a tax write off as they were under the Trump 2017 tax cuts and still are, if they were actually a liability, if they didn't exist, if billionaires and private jets didn't exist, guess what? We'd all have more years on our life. That is all the time that we have for this program, but we've got more on YouTube after right now. Stoneflower Dragon, thank you for your super chat. I found his pillows, I'm assuming Mike's, at my mom's house. I plan on burning them ceremonially. Are they good though? I feel like they're bad. I feel like, and even if they're good, they're bad.
Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.